questions. Um, when I uh, proposed this talk, um, I had quite a different talk in mind than I actually ended up with. Um, I was thinking we'd look at things like sort of M plus one, various sort of memory management issues and stuff. And then I started looking at where the problems were in uh, my own organization and other organizations that I'd worked with. And I realized that these uh, probably were not the main issues. But I'll be talking more about that over the next hour or so. Who am I? Um, I work for a company called um, Zero. We produce accounting um, software. Um, and my job role there is practice lead, um, which basically means um, I'm a developer and um, I talk a bit and uh, work with other teams to look at various practices that are working and not working. Um, I've written a couple of books on .NET and offered a couple of Pluralsight courses. All these slides, they're available on my website at simpleisbest.co.uk. Um, so I've got a few good references throughout the presentation, so don't feel you need to write them down because you can just go and download them um, from there. Um, I'm also going to say that I've certainly contributed my own share of um, crappy, unstable, and uh, slow code. So by no means am I a innocent in some of the things I'm going to be describing to you um, today. I have made all these mistakes and many more. Uh, obligatory disclaimer slide. Um, these are my own opinions. They're not necessarily my employer. Um, we will talk a bit about some of the things that we do at zero um, towards the end as well. So what are we going to do? Well, we're going to start off talking about fail. Um, and then what exactly failure is, how we can measure it, how we can define it. Um, and then we're going to move on to talking about patterns and anti-patterns. Um, and then we're going to wrap up with what we do at zero um, and some final thoughts uh, after that. So um, let's begin. Um, I think it's also important to acknowledge that what I'm going to be talking about here, I'm going to be talking about your typical line of business um, systems that I suspect many of us are working um, with, we're not talking um, about critical systems. So this picture here, this is the computer system of a Boeing 777. Um, I think we could all agree if something was to go wrong with that, there could be catastrophic failures. And although we could have some very bad failures if uh, things were to go wrong with, um, say, Zero or some of the other systems we're working with, um, hopefully um, no lives would uh, be lost. Um, it's, it's very interesting. Uh, if you hit that URL up, um, it talks in great detail about um, how this system was designed. Um, there's multiple levels of redundancy. Um, they ensure that there's not too much uh, communication on the wires connecting the machines. Um, it's really quite interesting. Um, the other thing I'm going to say is um, I'm going to be concentrating on some of these sort of software architecture perspectives. When we're talking about developing um, resilient and stable systems, um, there's a lot of other things we could talk about. Everything from process to hardware to um, network design, um, there's a heap of stuff there. For my uh, demos, um, I'm going to introduce you to um, my site, uh, hatforcat.com. And uh, this is a site we're going to be using to uh, demonstrate um, some of the patterns and anti-patterns here. Now, hatforcat.com, you can go to this. Uh, this is online. And the purpose of this site uh, is that you can purchase a hat for your, your uh, cat here. Um, and if anyone would like to um, invest in this uh, business, uh, please see me afterwards. So I can uh, go in here, I can select a hat, um, and uh, I can go and add that um, to the basket there. And uh, our, our cat will have a very nice black bowler hat um, to uh, wear there. Uh, down the uh, bottom of uh, the site here, we've got a couple of things. We have that uh, beautiful advert there. And um, we also have a list of our top selling um, hats at the moment um, over here. But we'll be coming back to uh, that later um, on in the uh, presentation. So um, what I'd like to do um, uh, now is um, I want to talk about uh, fail. Um, we're not that type of fail. Um, we'll talk about um, this type of fail, the sort of uh, home videos that are so enjoyable to watch. And um, there's something really enjoyable about watching someone else get hurt when it, it's not us. Um, or maybe this type of fail, and you can only um, anticipate what's going to uh, go wrong there. It's not going to be good. So um, Google uh, Software Reliability Engineering Group, um, they looked at some of the failures in their own systems. And they found that 70% of the outages um, were due to changes that had been made um, in the live system. And this brings us to an interesting point in that um, generally systems are pretty stable until you um, start actually making changes to them. And it's kind of this continual sort of arm wrestle between um, the stability of a system and introducing new features and uh, changes uh, here. Now, um, unless you're perhaps these guys and your site looks the same as it did 10 years ago, um, your customers probably are not going to be overly happy if your site and application stays the same um, and it, it never develops uh, further on. So it's really going to be up to you, depending on what your business is, um, in order to weigh up what the balance of these new features are. 
maybe if your system's uh, handling uh, air traffic control or something, um, you're probably going to be a little bit slower about how you're going to release some uh, changes. There's a number of different uh, reasons um, that systems can fail. Um, I've listed what I think are some of the top ones here. Um, configura configuration errors, uh, developer errors, bad requirements, hardware failure, um, inter-system component interaction. Um, that will often bring a lot of uh, systems down. And uh, there's many others as well. So what should we do about this? Well, one approach um, is to attempt to run away from um, this failure. And uh, this was a, an approach taken for many years and is still taken by uh, many developers um, and organizations. And organizations and developers, they'll attempt to anticipate every possible failure um, in an application and code some type of uh, um, remediation um, against these type of failures. Unfortunately, um, there's uh, a lot of things that can happen. So uh, relatively recently, um, Sydney, um, AWS region experienced um, an outage. This brought um, a number of ma major uh, sites down to its knees. Um, and I, in fairness, you know, AWS is it is pretty reliable on the whole. I, I mean, I know instances and will go down, but it's generally a service that you can rely on. So who could have you know imagined that uh, uh, an availability region would go down uh, here? Um, recently, uh, Telstra. Um, they've uh, had a bit of a bad year in terms of uh, reliability, really, in, on their, their network. Um, this brought down some uh, major systems. Um, people couldn't check into flights. Um, there was all sorts of uh, problems with this. Now, when your whole infrastructure um, level goes down, you know, that, that's a pretty serious uh, issue here. And no matter how careful you are as a um, developer or a coder, there's you know, relatively little you can uh, do about that um, unless you're, you know, you're running multiple um, uh, infrastructure providers uh, there. So probably the first thing um, that you really want to do, instead of attempting to run away um, and um, deal with this failure, is you want to embrace it. Because failure is inevitable. And over um, the next 40 minutes or so, um, I'm going to talk about all the ways that we can um, do this and cope with um, these type of scenarios better. Uh, one way of uh, looking at this um, is uh, patterns. And there's a lot of patterns. These have been around for a very long time. Um, and they're also very easy to implement a lot of these, um, but they'll cope with a, a lot of uh, different uh, issues. Probably the um, canonical reference on um, patterns is this book here by uh, Robert um, uh, S. Hanmer, um, Patterns for Fault Tolerant uh, Software. And it was released in um, 2006. Um, unfortunately, for some um, reason um, unknown to me, it's almost $2,000 to go and buy a paperback copy of this book. Um, this is a real shame because this is actually one of those computing books that you probably do actually want on your uh, desk in, in order to use as a reference. Um, you can, however, get it in electronic format for about $50, which would be my recommendation, and, unless you're particularly uh, rich there. Um, it contains uh, details of probably about 50 or 60 different um, patterns um, to do with um, resiliency, um, designing resilient systems. And this is everything from things like um, retry logic um, to uh, manual patterns and approaches, which are uh, just as um, important. Um, one thing that is worth mentioning is uh, he tends to have uh, academic names for these patterns, which will not be familiar to uh, anyone. Um, but you can, it's a good book. Like any architectural decision, implementing some of the things I'm going to show you um, is a trade-off. And um, you might get uh, some increases um, in resilience and reliability, but it's going to impact um, other areas. You're probably going to have additional complexity um, in your code. It's going to take a bit longer to develop. Um, you're going to have um, availability consistency issues, um, cap theorem type stuff. Maybe it's going to slow your system down um, in order to um, make it uh, scale better. So these things, they, they don't come at zero cost. Um, there is a cost. And it's going to be up to you with your uh, applications to weigh up. Um, these particular costs here. I think a, a number of the patterns that I'm going to go through, they kind of depend um, on these three principles here, which are probably good principles anyway in order to develop um, scalable um, systems. Statelessness, um, ID potence, which I never know how to pronounce, um, and location transparency. Um, ID potence, ID potence uh, the ability to make the same request um, multiple times and receive the same result often implemented by including some kind of ID in the request that can be ticked off um, that that request has already been processed. Uh, by location transparency, um, if you're tying requests to a specific IP address um, or hard-coded something, it's going to be harder to go and modify and uh, change that at a later point if you need to. Um, 
rather than say if you're using, um, I don't know, some uh, sort of DNS based um, solution. I'm going to add another one. I don't think it strictly fits in with um, these, but uh, I think we can all agree that feature toggles are a, a, a pretty good thing generally, um, and uh, that these can assist with um, your applications. And if you do find issues, um, being able to turn off a new feature you've introduced is um, certainly a, a good thing. As a general guide, um, there's uh, something called the Reactive Manifesto, um, which has been put together. Who's, who's heard of the, this? It's been around since 2014 or so. Um, now, this is a, 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 it's fairly short if you go head over to reactivemanifesto.org, um, but it's a good set of principles um, to develop um, scalable and resilient applications. Um, it's well worth a uh, read. Um, and they say that systems built as reactive systems are more flexible, loosely coupled, and scalable. This makes them easier to develop and amenable to change. Um, and they're significantly more tolerant of failure. And when failure does occur, they meet it with elegance rather than disaster. And this tolerance is uh, something we're going to be talking um, a lot about. Um, and it's very important um, uh, for uh, resilient systems. The first anti-pattern that I want to talk about um, is not defining um, targets. And when I mean targets, I mean um, actually setting about how our system should behave, what, what should uh, uh, it be able to cope with. When we're talking about reliability of um, systems, um, a lot of people think um, in terms of availability or the number of nines a system is available for. So 90% um, availability over a year, um, that means it, there could be a downtime of um, 36 uh, days, which is probably unacceptable for the majority of uh, systems here. I would guess the majority of um, systems um, or uh, with companies that are still in business perhaps, um, fall somewhere between the uh, two and uh, four uh, nines here. Um, it's obviously going to be dependent on what your application is as to the, the type of um, availability that uh, you're going to be targeting. If you have some kind of e-commerce site like Hat for Cat, um, you can probably cope with eight hours people not being able to purchase headwear um, for their felines. If, however, you're working with um, pacemaker software, um, eight hours could be a bit of a long time there. Google um, suggests when looking at the availability of a system, um, you could potentially perform a cost-benefit uh, calculation. So, for example, if you were going to uh, improve your system's availability from 99.9 .9 to um, two nines um, availability there, we could say this is uh, an increase in availability of uh, 0.09. If our theoretical service um, has uh, $1 million uh, revenue, um, we can then turn this um, 0.09 um, into a percentage and say that uh, if uh, that uh, could potentially um, give us an increase in $900 um, worth of uh, revenue there. Now, it's a simplistic model. Um, I'm not going to uh, disagree um, with that there. But if you're spending more than $900 um, there, um, then potentially you might be wasting your money because you might not make um, any more money there. Now, of course, we're ignoring things like service level agreements, your reputation, um, all sorts of uh, things like that. But this brings us to um, an important point in that it's much more expensive um, to go and increase um, these uh, levels of availability the, the, the higher and higher you go. And Google estimate that um, of all requests, uh, ISPs actually screw this up um, between 0.01 and 1% of all requests um, that are made to uh, services. So if you're plowing a lot of money um, into increasing the availability of uh, your services, this could be lost um, in the noise of uh, ISPs uh, here. One way of uh, measuring um, availability um, is uh, from engineering called mean time to failure. And I guess it would be used with something like, say, a car tire. And you might say, uh, over time, we expect um, my car tire or wheels um, to last uh, about two years. Um, until we get um, failure uh, indicated by the universal symbol of uh, failure there. What's potentially more useful in terms of computer systems is uh, the mean time to recovery, how quickly you can bring your system back up online again. So we have our failure occur there, um, and then we can quickly recover, and we have the MTBF um, in between these points here, the mean time um, between failure. There's a number of considerations when you're coming up with um, these targets and uh, items in that your um, availability um, can never be more than any third party system you're depending on um, here. So if uh, you've got a third party that's down 50% of the time, that's, that's uh, sure as hell gonna impact the availability of your systems here. 
functions and systems also have different levels of importance. Um, the ability of users to log into your application is probably a lot more important than the ability to change their profile pic, for example. And then, of course, there's different levels of uh, users and uh, severity of errors. Um, all in all, when you're beginning to develop um, uh, s services and systems, the important point to consider is what does your system require? And this is so important and it's missed out across um, many different components. People don't define how many requests it should respond to, how, what load it should cope with. And without these um, factors, how can you actually um, test and ensure that your system will respond to these things? Okay, let's move on to dependent systems. Um, I've got this uh, lovely GIF here, and you can imagine this isn't going to end well. Um, and uh, those guys, they spend all their time, and, and uh, that dude in the middle, um, unfortunately, was the guy that placed the domino that brought the whole thing uh, down there. Um, have a watch that again, because we quite enjoy um, that failure. <laughs> he, he leans back, oh, and I, it's a, a bad thing. Let, let's uh, leave him in uh, peace. So um, this is a very common uh, issue. I'd like you to imagine um, A is some kind of uh, front end for our website and is dependent on the servers, services B, C, and uh, D. Um, something goes wrong in uh, C here, um, but uh, unfortunately, um, this is actually gonna propagate um, down to uh, the other services uh, in our uh, application there, um, unless we uh, actually handle um, this type of failure. And introducing what I'm gonna term um, the uh, flood of uh, fail here. So, uh, if we go um, over to uh, our site uh, here, and I'm going to, uh, this is a, an MVC project, and I have a web API um, backend for this that's being called, and I'm using the REST Sharp library to go and make uh, some of these requests. So uh, I'm just gonna go and throw um, an exception um, in our uh, advert here. We'll um, go and build that. Uh, Visual Studio will uh, chug away and uh, we'll go and uh, refresh our page here. Um, and as you might imagine, um, we're gonna have some uh, problems um, when that .NET uh, compilation uh, completes there. And this is an incredibly uh, common thing um, to do, that in a uh, system, someone will make a call uh, to another system um, and uh, it will bring the whole site down. Now, in this example, uh, that particular method was serving up uh, an advert for our users. Now, despite what um, your friends in marketing may tell you, um, that is not critical to the function of hatforcat.com. And uh, what is important to hatforcat.com is that we continue to sell hats um, for people for their cats, otherwise cats will get cold heads and bad things will happen and they'll wreak terrible revenge. So we're gonna need to uh, sort that out. And of course, um, a very easy way of uh, sorting uh, that out um, is uh, we can um, go back to uh, our uh, controller there and um, we can, uh, I'm just gonna comment out the other one, and I tend to lose the ability to uh, type when I'm uh, talking, so uh, I like to use comment blocks like uh, this, and we'll um, very simply handle that with a try-catch block. Um, we're all familiar with uh, that, very, very easy to uh, implement, um, but uh, there are so many sites that won't even take that simplest level. They'll assume that some downstream uh, system will uh, work, um, and when it can be very trivially handled, um, exceptions uh, such as uh, this. And a way of uh, uh, handling these type of failures um, is bulkheads. And these come from um, ship terminology, where if there was a uh, leak uh, in a ship, we'd have a watertight um, compartment that would contain um, the uh, damage and where uh, this could um, go to. And we can do the same um, with some of our uh, systems uh, here. And you don't necessarily need to implement these bulkheads via separate servers or separate instances. Um, these could be sort of virtual bulkheads in terms of resource or memory constraints. Um, and uh, this works quite well uh, with um, some other patterns that we're gonna talk about. I think another very large mistake is um, assuming network reliability. I think we've all done it, we've developed some code. Um, it runs absolutely fine when we've got everything um, on our local machine. Uh, but it turns out when it runs over the network, it doesn't work so well. And um, if you're not familiar with the um, Deutsch's eight fallacies of distributed computing, um, you really should be, because this is so important on some of the systems we're developing. And Deutsch came up with um, a number of different uh, fallacies here, um, which can basically be um, summed up as assuming the network is reliable. Uh, it's really not, and uh, you cannot rely um, on the 
100% perfect uh, network connect, uh, connect to. Especially um, in the, as we move towards more and more um, distributed uh, systems. Now, a guy called Leslie Lamport, he has the lovely quote that a distributed system is one in which the failure of a computer you didn't even know existed can render your own computer um, unusable, which is awesome. And uh, there's a trend to even more distributed systems, things like microservices, mobile, internet of things, and uh, cloud. Now, I'm gonna focus on mobile. So, uh, some, a site called opensignal.com, and they produce a report on how uh, the percentage of time people have 4G connections. So in Australia, um, they found that 22% of the time people didn't have a uh, 4G co uh, connection. Um, slight variations, um, I guess, depending on, on the uh, network. And depending on where you are in the world, uh, this can get uh, even uh, worse. So we have our friends up in uh, South Korea there, which have 97% uh, um, 4G coverage, which is just an incredible um, infrastructure. Um, I'm so jealous. And right down to uh, Sh Sri Lanka there, uh, and there must be some other places in the world that maybe even have none or lower than that, but they have 39% uh, um, down the bottom there. So if you're designing your application and you've tested it on a 4G connection, um, there's a, a, a good chance that a quarter of the time it's uh, not going to uh, work. Um, <laughs> In, unless you've actually gone and tested this. So don't assume that the network's um, reliable. Um, it isn't, and people uh, tend to go out of signal, they go into the tunnels, um, all sorts of things happen. So what can you do about that? Well, a very easy way to um, resolve some of these uh, things is to use uh, a retry. And this can um, resolve transient um, uh, failures. So um, also some of those failures where no one really knows why it failed, it, it just did, and tried again, and it's all good. Um, it's very easy to uh, implement, and we, um, we'll talk about exponential backoff in a second. So uh, on the uh, .NET uh, platform, um, a library uh, that makes uh, this very easy uh, to implement is uh, called Poly. Is anyone using this in their applications at the moment? Um, it's available on NuGet. Uh, it's been around for um, at least two or three years now. Um, it's very stable, um, and uh, it contains inbuilt um, functionality for some of the patterns um, I'm going to uh, be showing you uh, here. So, for example, our, our top selling uh, hats here, I'm going to go and uh, comment that out. And I'm going to need to uh, comment that one. Uh, what do we do? Well, with Poly, um, we install the uh, package. Um, we tell it we want to handle um, HTTP exceptions. Um, and um, we can then tell it, um, and there's various ways that you can define this, that we want to um, retry a certain number of times, that we want to um, retry after one second, after two seconds, and after three seconds. And we then give it a, uh, a delegate that we're going to execute um, there, which is just uh, the uh, request there. So can you implement this yourself? Yes, of course. Um, but Poly makes it very um, easy to go and implement uh, this type of uh, logic. So uh, we'll go back to uh, our slides there. And um, this brings us um, to uh, timeouts. Um, this is another incredibly easy thing um, to add to your applications um, that uh, a lot of people don't. So um, just to show you the uh, type of uh, issues that timeouts um, can cause, I'm going to go into my uh, web API project here, and I'm going to go and introduce um, a, uh, a thread sleep here for 20 seconds. We'll go and compile um, the application there, and uh, when that's um, compiled, uh, we'll go and refresh uh, the, uh, the web page there, and um, we're not going to get that back for some time. And uh, in addition to the .NET compilation time, it's going to be at least 20 seconds before that, uh, that uh, page is going to be rendered. And that's a really crappy experience for your uh, users. Um, it's much better to um, fail um, fast on uh, this type of thing. Um, there's resources being used. Your users probably got bored. Um, they've gone off to one of um, Hat for Cat's uh, competitors many competitors, and uh, um, that's, a, a, that's a, bad, uh, a bad thing. So what can we do? Well, um, sure enough, REST Sharp um, uh, has a uh, timeout property. Um, very easy uh, to uh, implement, um, and uh, we'll go and uh, comment that out, and I'm gonna go and compile uh, the uh, application, and uh, it's gone and uh, compiled there. I'm gonna go back to uh, my solution, uh, we'll uh, refresh that, and we'll get that slight chuggers.net uh, does its uh, business. Um, 
and uh, but much better experience. We scroll down, um, and we see, oh, sorry, uh, things are unavailable. Um, yep, it's not the ideal experience. We want to present the uh, users, but it's still a lot better than people leaving our site because they've got bored of uh, waiting um, around, uh, around there. Now, pretty much every um, web request library will have some type of timeout property. Um, Front-end um, devs often forget this, so XHR request has it. Um, the new fetch API, which is the new um, way of making these type of requests, does not have a timeout property, um, which is interesting. And uh, I'm sure some front-end guys can argue with me about this, but it, it does seem a strange omission. And I think some of this is because um, the promise-based nature of this and that the API developers felt this should be uh, dealt with in a different way. Now, you can implement timeouts with uh, fetch. It's just a bit more complicated um, in order to do. Um, and you'll find several Stack Overflow um, posts on how to do that. But incredibly uh, easy uh, thing to uh, implement. Um, but uh, a lot of people um, don't tend to uh, do this. And by having timeouts, we ensure that we don't hog resources for calls that will never succeed. We maintain a responsive system. Um, if it is going to fail, um, it's going to fail quickly. Your user is going to receive um, a better response. And we can combine this um, using uh, retry um, logic if we want to. Circuit breaker. Um, in the olden days, when electricity was first out, when there was too much current flowing through a uh, system, um, it would set fire to um, the wires and burn people's houses down, um, which was obviously a bad thing. So what was uh, done was when this, uh, there was too much uh, current, this switch would uh, go and flip, breaking the circuit and stopping um, these uh, fires uh, here. And we can do something very similar um, with uh, Poly. Um, so I'm going to come back into uh, my uh, application and um, uh, scroll up uh, here and uh, duh, duh, duh. and I'm just going to need to comment out the old one there. We'll comment that out and I'm going to talk you through in just a sec what we're uh, doing here as this one's a little bit more complex than uh, some of the other ones. So what do we have? Um, I've said that there can be two exceptions um, when we go and uh, call um, the advert before the circuit is uh, broken. Um, and I've also defined a time span here of uh, one minute, which is the time before the circuit will reset automatically. We've got our uh, advert here. Um, and I've also made uh, this circuit breaker policy um, static here, as it needs to maintain a count of the uh, failures. Now, there is a, obviously an issue with that in that this count is only going to exist um, for, for this app domain here. So we have it, if we have it across multiple servers, um, they're each going to have their own uh, count uh, here. Now, Poly doesn't define an easy way of giving that a different backing store. Um, so it, it does have some limitations uh, here. Uh, I'm going to compile this application. Um, I'm going to, once that's uh, compiled, uh, I'm going to better take that, uh, oops, that uh, time out for as well. Otherwise, that's going to get a bit annoying. And uh, we'll refresh that, and uh, we'll go here, we'll refresh uh, that. And what I'm doing in uh, my circuit breaker example is when there's um, a uh, failure, um, I'm just going to print out the message exception has occurred. Um, so we should get a couple of those um, before finally the uh, circuit is uh, broken there. Um, we see we've got exception recurred. I'll go and refresh that, we get another one. Um, and then finally we get the circuit broken. Now, why is that important? It means that we can stop um, making requests um, that will never succeed. We can save our resources, we can fail quickly, and we can get back to our users um, and give them a uh, better experience. Um, you can, of course, implement that logic uh, yourself, but I, I do think um, Poly makes it um, quite nice, although the, uh, the use of statics isn't um, ideal. So um, these things, uh, they've actually um, got a bit of an issue, though. Because if you start combining retry and timeout, there's a bit of a gotcha that can uh, happen. So I need to imagine we've got a five second timeout and we've said we're gonna go and retry um, these requests here. So I have three services, um, service A, B, and C. Um, service A um, is gonna send a request to service uh, B. Um, service B is gonna receive this request and say uh, around two seconds. Service B is gonna send this um, request to uh, service C um, four seconds. Now, service C's got this, and by the time it goes and processes it, it's going to go and send um, this request back up the stream here. Um, but uh, 
oh, we've, we've we're at six seconds here, uh, here. And we said, we're gonna time out um, here after uh, five seconds. So we've got a bit of a problem because service C is then gonna send stuff back. Um, but A's not interested anymore because he said, I'm gonna um, time out after uh, five seconds here. So by implementing um, this policy, um, we've actually made things worse because um, service uh, C won't have time, so service A is going to fire off another request at the same time while this request is still traveling back from service uh, C. What to do about this? Um, one option would be to pass some kind of expiration with your requests here, because if you start having these services respond a little bit slowly, then it's going to take a lot longer and you're going to end up actually hammering your systems um, with this type of uh, setup uh, here. Trusting input. Um, big security um, no-no, um, and I think the majority of us, um, we know that any input coming into um, APIs or systems is not to be trusted um, when it's from uh, users. If not, there's certainly some talks you should be attending at this conference. But um, where we tend to screw up, um, and I did this on a project recently, um, is that um, people tend to trust input in their own internal systems. So uh, we were working with uh, some other teams, um, they got some bad data um, from an external service. Um, they then passed it on to us. Because uh, they were an internal service um, to us, we thought, yeah, that data's all good. Um, we'll take that. Um, and uh, we then have this error flow down um, through these uh, services here. So whenever you're um, developing services, um, don't trust anyone. Um, certainly don't trust your colleagues. Um, they probably screw something up. There'll be an accident. Um, Yes, it's going to introduce a little bit more complexity um, in your code, uh, but mistakes do happen. And uh, if, uh, I don't know, God forbid, someone gets inside your network, you, your service is more secure. So um, do not trust um, anyone. Um, any service should be uh, standalone um, and uh, treated as such. No plan B um, or uh, C. Um, I think uh, Netflix really pioneered this, uh, or certainly were most public um, about how they uh, approached this. So um, most of you probably know Netflix, they have this movie um, recommendation or movie and TV program recommendation system, um, which works really great as long as you use profiles, um, apart from mine's now full of kids' programs because my wife refuses to use her own profile. Um, so I get Jake the Pirate and Wiggles and all sorts of things. Um, but anyway, Netflix has uh, this recommendation system. So when uh, uh, you log into networks, it says, hey, you might be interested in these TV shows and uh, films. And the first option they'll give you is a completely personalized recommendation. But if that's not available, they'll fall back to a list of popular movies. Um, if uh, that's not available, um, they'll give you a fixed list that someone's defined. And finally, um, nothing at all. Now, this is a much better experience than um, not being able to use uh, Netflix at all. Um, if one um, system was down in the uh, chain. The problem I found um, with this sort of fallback logic, um, it's not a technical one, it's actually a business one. So I found talking to some of our product owners, so I'd say to them, well, okay, what, what happens if uh, this system's not working? What, what's the experience you want? And they'll say, but it's gotta be working, it's gotta be working always. Um, and, and that's bullshit, we all know things fail and things and bad things uh, happen. So work with the business and say, well, okay, yes, we'll try to cheer it up all the time. But what about those days it's not? Do you really not want people to be able to sign up for your application or site? Um, is there some other experience um, that we could give uh, the users? Um, and the answer is almost certainly uh, yes. So, I'd, uh, yeah. Uh, not uh, planning um, for uh, success um, is uh, uh, a, a major uh, issue. So, um, what often happens um, is people, uh, particularly on e-commerce sites, there might be some kind of special offer. Um, there's been a few public instances of this with Xbox promotions, launches, computer game launches, and um, they'll say, oh, don't worry, um, we'll go and uh, scale up um, the number of uh, web servers um, in order to cope with this increased demand. Um, but what, of course, happens with this um, is that all these order requests um, change from being a small amount to this massive amount, um, and uh, our order processor at the back there can potentially be um, overloaded. What to do about this? Well, you can potentially shed load, and you could, um, too much load is just gonna ruin things for everyone. No one's gonna be able to order um, an Xbox if the entire site goes down. So you can look at uh, implementing various gateways, um, bounded queues, uh, some leaky bucket um, is a, a particular pattern. 
So you might say, I'm only going to have uh, a thousand orders in a queue before um, I'm going to accept any more. Um, people have implemented logic such as uh, if people don't have um, anything in the basket, they'll be re redirected uh, elsewhere um, in the, the site, um, or a session won't be established um, until people actually add something to a basket. So there's a number of different ways um, you can uh, handle this. Uh, next anti-pattern I want to talk about is no monitoring. And um, this is uh, something that tends to happen quite often, is it's something that's added after a problem has occurred. Um, and really, when you're developing your applications, I'd encourage you to, um, right from uh, the very uh, beginning, um, to be uh, including uh, monitoring uh, in your uh, applications. And one uh, good thing to consider is, what would you want to uh, wake you up um, at uh, 2, uh, 2 a.m. in your applications? Because of course, if you have too many notifications, um, then it just becomes noise, people ignore pages, um, yeah. So Kickstarter, they look at um, what are the number of uh, pledges as a key metric. And they know that um, if something changes radically here, then it probably means that something's um, gone wrong in their applications. Um, Etsy, um, they monitor the uh, number of orders. Google um, suggests you should be always looking at four um, key metrics. Um, the request latency, um, traffic, number of errors, and saturation. So uh, at a minimum, um, you should be uh, looking at uh, these items. Next anti-pattern, assuming it works. And as developers, um, I think we're uh, all uh, guilty of uh, this one. Now there's a lady called um, Katie McCaffrey. Um, she now works for Twitter. Previously, she's worked um, on the project Orleans, um, some of the, the Halo large-scale systems. And she says, uh, without explicitly forcing a system to fail, it is unreasonable to have any confidence that it will operate um, in failure modes, which you can take as test your shit. Um, there's a number of different ways of doing this. We've got the usual unit integration testing stuff. Um, I think we're all pretty familiar with um, Netflix's uh, Simeon Army. It will deliberately turn um, on and off um, applications and uh, services in order to check um, that people have coded um, um, for these type of scenarios. Another thing that's uh, becoming more popular um, it's something called game days. And this is where you deliberately introduce a fault or failure um, in your system and check that uh, the uh, system can cope with it and the team. And it's a great way of uh, learning for the team. They get a real world um, scenario. You check your processes um, and you'll probably discover some interesting things. Now you're gonna have to work with a business in order to establish um, when is a good time to uh, run a game day because you can imagine the conversation. I want to deliberately break um, our uh, uh, our system and check how it works, that's probably not going to go down so well and it's probably going to need some careful communication around that. You're also going to potentially want to avoid some key uh, dates. So we deal with um, accounting data, we would not do that accounting year end. Um, yeah. Google um, have a, a system called uh, Chubby Lock which manages, um, uh, it's a distributed uh, lock um, system and it's, it's, very, it's used on a number of um, their uh, systems. And what they were finding was that uh, people had come to actually rely on this always being available. So they've got a bit lazy um, with uh, some of their uh, coding uh, here. So what Google started doing was deliberately um, breaking um, this uh, system to ensure that people were coping with uh, failures of uh, this uh, lock system. Uh, there's a study by um, uh, Yuan um, and uh, a number of other people in 2014, and they looked, about, looked at about 200 or so um, businesses um, uh, failures and into why these systems were actually failing and um, they found that 92% of catastrophic failures were due to the incorrect handling of uh, non-fatal errors. 77% of production failures um, could have been reproduced um, by a unit test. 58% of catastrophic failures um, and underlying faults could have been detected through simple testing of error handling code. And 35% of uh, catastrophic failures are caused by trivial um, mistakes in error handling uh, logic. Now this is stuff that we as developers can do better. This is, this is where we're failing potentially as uh, developers and teams. Um, and it, it, it sounds very simple, we know it's not, but this is something I believe that we can uh, do, do a bit better. So um, I work for a company called Zero. Um, I've been with uh, Zero probably about the last um, coming up to two years now. 
Um, we've got uh, just under 1,500 uh, staff globally. Um, we've got about 700,000 uh, paying subscribers. Um, and it, we've got uh, a lot of businesses um, using the uh, Xero platform. Uh, this is uh, what it uh, looks like for those of you who haven't seen it. Um, and it's got functionality for your, your basic accounts, uh, payroll, um, and a, a heap of other stuff which I haven't come into contact with, I guess, tax, and um, making a major uh, components. Now, um, Xero, um, eight or nine years ago, began life um, as a, a relatively simple uh, application. Uh, there was a server and a database. Now, as you can imagine, um, as customers increased, that didn't uh, tend to scale so well. Uh, there's a blog post down here by our chief of uh, architecture, um, and he goes into a bit more detail than I'm going to if you want to refer to some of this. So one of the first things um, that was done um, is that we sharded um, the uh, database in order to uh, achieve that uh, scalability. But as uh, the business grew and grew, um, then that didn't work uh, either. So um, the model um, we have now um, is what we're referring to as a cell-based model. Now, a cell um, contains everything that's needed to um, run the application, and one cell cannot talk to another. So there's also some security um, benefits from uh, doing this. We can um, run up a, a new cell um, relatively uh, quickly uh, as well. One of the really sort of important things I think is often neglected um, is uh, some guidelines. So I've taken some guidelines here. These are our um, service, um, our SOA guidelines. So anyone um, developing a service uh, we suggest it adheres to uh, these uh, is there, is there seven? seven guidelines uh, here. So um, abstract everything. Um, your services should hide the implementation details. You shouldn't know about particular technologies. Um, consistency, if a service uses a concept, um, uh, if you've got a, a concept that's shared across services, it should be used in the same way. Otherwise, things become quite confusing. We'll try and push a contracts first um, approach. So uh, teams will talk about how services should interact before uh, even a line of uh, code has been written. Design for public in access. Um, any integration will be via um, events. Services should uh, self-manage and um, teams should be able to manage the service themselves. And overall, um, simplicity. Now, these are just a set of some of the guidelines, but I do think these type of guidelines, processes, and education um, in the team can have a big impact in terms of um, the um, reliability and resiliency of uh, your uh, applications. Um, it might be fairly tricky to come up with some of these guidelines, but use things like the reactive manifesto. Make sure your team members um, and developers are aware of them. Um, and I, th I think uh, that's a, a pretty low cost um, start. We uh, use a number of uh, monitoring and uh, metrics in order to check our applications are running properly. Um, we use something called um, Datadog, and what this allows you to do is you can send it various information, um, and you can construct uh, dashboards um, from uh, this uh, information. So for example, we might have counters on the number of requests or the number of signups, um, and this will be sent to Datadog, and you can then create your own dashboard, and uh, each team will have a dashboard for their service so they can see what's running um, and uh, how it's going. Uh, PagerGD is um, used. Um, it is what it sounds like. Um, Amazon CloudWatch, uh, Nedios. Um, we use a tool called Sumo Logic. Um, this is a bit like Splunk. I don't know how many people are using that, but um, it's basically a log querying tool um, on steroids, I guess. You can perform a lot of very clever filtering. Um, you can produce graphs from some of the reports. Um, it, it's, a, it's a cool tool. We have um, dedicated teams um, so that if any issues do occur, they refer to themselves as the sniper and bomber command teams. Um, but if there is an urgent issue in the application, these guys have the knowledge um, and abilities to respond very quickly um, to go and fix um, and deploy this. Uh, a colleague of mine um, uh, called Hannah Gray, she's got a presentation um, on uh, some of this structure and some of our learnings um, from this, but we found this um, worked quite well. Uh, in the future, um, we're moving towards um, having operations supporting teams. Some teams already have this, um, some teams uh, don't, but it, it's certainly where we want to be with um, that uh, sort of knowledge and level of support. We'll also be encouraging the use of uh, messages, queues, um, things like poly um, and uh, designing um, for uh, failure. So what's uh, potentially the future of this? Well, I think um, a particularly interesting area is something called formal verification. 
And this is where you produce a mathematical model of how a system should behave. Now, this has been around in the academic world um, for quite a long time now, um, but it's sort of just starting to creep into maybe uh, commercial use. Uh, Amazon used this and they found uh, a couple of issues, um, I think it was with the S3 component of their application. Um, so this is in use in um, the real world. There's a, a language um, called uh, COG, which is C-O-Q. Apparently there's a uh, tradition, um, it's developed by uh, some French developers, and there's a tradition to uh, call your languages after animals. Um, crazy French, I don't know. Um, but it, it's free to use. Um, probably the main barrier to uh, entry, and why I'm not demonstrating it to you now, um, is that it requires a reasonable level of um, uh, math um, knowledge in order to be able to use it. So at the moment, I think that's probably going to be a bit of a barrier to uptake for this. But it's pretty cool because you could potentially use this language um, and you can, this language will actually generate code um, as well once you've adequately described your system. There's various processes which can um, assist you um, de designing, um, developing resilient systems. Um, there's uh, one from Microsoft there um, that uses formal verification. Um, Encourage fault injection at game days. You know, Netflix has been talking about fault injection um, since probably the last four or five years or so. Yet a lot of um, a lot of uh, applications and uh, people are still not doing this. Game days again, a relatively cheap thing um, to implement, but I think you'll learn a lot um, from your uh, applications to doing this. The actor model. This is proving to be quite a, a good way of um, managing. Um, and scaling uh, applications. It's uh, a pattern that's been around since the uh, 70s, um, but it's starting to gain a bit of popularity and movement now um, with uh, cloud computing and improved uh, computing uh, power. There's a number of sessions, there's uh, one on um, this afternoon um, on uh, aka.net. Um, if you don't know what these patterns are, uh, I'd hi well, these are frameworks, but if you don't know what these are, I'd highly recommend you attend um, one of these sessions because I think these are going to be a big deal. Um, over the next few years. This is a good way um, of uh, developing some scalable and reliable uh, applications. More automation intelligence, um, self-learning systems, systems that see when boundaries uh, are exceeded um, and can potentially uh, deal with some of that failure. So putting together this presentation, I've been really influenced by um, these two books, which if you haven't um, read them, um, I'd highly recommend you do so. Uh, there's a book called Release It here. Um, it is Java focused, but the examples are simple enough that you know no developer is going to have trouble reading a lot of them. Um, Michael um, goes into a lot of detail. He gives real world scenarios um, and examples of failures that occurred on some very large applications and how they dealt with them. Um, he talks about <coughs> some of the patterns that um, I've spoken about today. Um, so I'd really recommend that book. And it's a relatively short read as well. This is a, an awesome book, um, Site Reliability Engineering. So Google have a, a, an interesting approach to how they ensure their applications uh, are always running. Um, they created uh, something called Site Reliability um, Engineering Group. And this book um, goes into great detail about uh, Google's uh, technical architecture, which is really awesome as developers. It's, I'm just reading this and I'm like, wow, that's really cool. That's how you know, that's scaled and that's how that's done. They talk about failures that they've had there. Um, they talk about a failure where um, an entire data center gets wiped. Um, so there's some good stuff um, in this book. And there's a lot of learnings about how to run processes and uh, departments um, as well. I was also interested, um, influenced a lot by the, uh, these two uh, people here. Um, Katie McCaffrey, she talks and writes a lot about this stuff. Um, her presentations are awesome. So um, if this is an area that interests you, um, and Katie's worked with some enormous systems like Twitter, um, the Halo social stuff. Um, it's, it's well worth uh, following uh, these guys. Um, I'm not sure how to pronounce this guy's name. You were uh, Friedrichson? I'm not sure. Um, but he writes a lot about patterns um, and has got some great presentations. So um, if you take away one thing um, from uh, my presentation, um, ap apart from uh, hatforcat.com, um, um, it should be that shit happens. Um, it, it really does, no matter how careful you are with the design um, and development of your um, applications, there are just some failures um, that you can't deal with. And the only um, sane approach to this um, is to code with failure um, in their mind. So 
Um, embrace fail, um, by uh, all means. Um, don't vote for Donald Trump, I guess. Um, but uh, no, embrace the failure of your uh, systems um, is what I'm uh, encouraging you to do because um, the failure is coming for your systems. Um, yeah. Thank you very much. Does anyone have any questions? <laughs> Uh, what did you bulkhead other than threads? What, what did I bulkhead? Sorry, the question is, what did I bulkhead other than uh, threads? Um, so uh, our systems will be divide, designed as uh, separate uh, instances, um, scaled on you know, different nodes. They won't have um, state. Um, so there's a, there's a lot of different approaches to bulkheading. So you could have um, the separate instances, which are, I guess, the most obvious approach. Um, if you had some kind of uh, something like VMware or whatever, you could limit resources. So you could say this service can consume no more than, um, I don't know, 100 meg or whatever. Um, so I guess it's more a philosophy um, rather than a physical. So the second question was, was it more physical uh, sharing or th just the logical sharing? So I'm assuming you're more physical than just logical sharing of resources and splitting uh, resources. W w the projects I've worked on, um, we'd probably create separate instances, I guess. Okay. Yep. Oh, well, I'll be around the whole conference, so if anyone's got any questions, feel free to tap me on the shoulder. Thank you very much. Enjoy the rest of the conference.